Well, hey, everybody. Digging deeper. Another week. Pete and Brandon here. And kind of a weird uh, conversation because you went in a direction talking about motives of pastors. And here are now two pastors talking about their motives together and, on, the internet. Uh, on the internet. So we Look are going us. to try to convince people that we have good motives in today's <laughs> Digging Deeper podcast. Um, but yeah, you look at First Thessalonians, the first part of chapter two. And uh, man, it was, it's one of those, it was one of those messages. It's like, sometimes I wonder, um, like there's conversations that take place in the kind of church world in terms of like staff world. And then there's like congregants. And it's just, it's weird to have that conversation because it felt very like, oh yeah, we all, we all know exactly what you're talking about. And then those in the congregation probably are like, we've heard stories about this and now we're starting to wonder, <laughs> like, you know, so I just, I was curious like how it all landed. Cause I'm sure everyone had that thing hit differently based upon their exposure, their lack of and stuff. So, I mean, was that difficult for you yesterday or even in preparation in light of just kind of the different ways that people could perhaps interpret that message, knowing your own church hurt, which you kind of explained a little bit in the message, like yeah. what was the process of like trying to work through that in your heart before speaking about it? Um, that's a, that's actually, a, it's interesting that you asked that question. We, we didn't talk about this beforehand. Um, I have had, I, I've had a lot of other jobs before I was full-time ministry and even in part-time ministry, I had other jobs. I've worked in lumber yards of construction, painting, lots of different things. And uh, generally speaking, what we do is a uh, is a mental game more than a physical game. You yeah, know? that's fair. Yeah, uh, so exhausted <laughs> this weekend. It just wore me out. I, partly because I I came in on Friday for about three or four hours, and when I left on Friday afternoon, which is usually a day that we take off, I I just didn't feel good. I didn't feel it was like ugh. Then on Saturday, I was in the morning. I just was like, did a weird, un so I came in after lunch on Saturday and was here for three or four hours and rewrote the whole thing. And um, I think it's just like, and then Saturday night, I was just like, oh man, I told my wife, I'm like, I, I was laying in bed on Saturday night and I said, can I call in sick tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, you're preaching. I'm like, yeah, but Brandon could jump in and cover for me. And then uh, when I got up on Sunday morning and I, I was like getting ready and Julie was already downstairs, she's like, you ready? And I, and I said, do you think it's too late to just like pick a different topic? <laughs> I was like, I could probably just pull one out from a long time ago. Uh, I, I did not want to, didn't really want to do it at all. Um, I wouldn't have done it had it not been the text as I saw it. Um, yeah. It wasn't like a topic that I was like, hey, I want to talk about this. It was just like I opened it and I was like, that seems like what it was saying. So, yeah, I, I just was, I don't know, it just like a weird exhaustion, not like a good exhaustion of like sometimes when you do something well, you work hard and it goes well, you're just like, oh, I feel good. I'm going to take a nap. It was more like, oh. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know how it landed. I, I guess um, I'm curious, I suppose, but I'm curious in a way of like, I don't really want to know because <laughs> you, know, you ever have that where you're like, Oh, if it's really, if it really landed poorly, I'm like, oh no, I just, then I won't sleep better if, it, if I hear that. I mean, that. I didn't so, hear, I get limited feedback, but I mean, I, I didn't hear that in the hallway. It wasn't like this buzz of like, man, what was that about and stuff. I think that uh, the part for me that was really interesting, like as being the lead pastor, sitting and listening to it and just kind of almost kind of feeling like, are people looking at me right now? Because <laughs> like, you never really affirmed people about Rice City. Yeah, so. <laughs> and that was a part that was like, I think it was good, but I, but it was yeah. just one of those things. I was kind of like looking around if and time with uh, my wife and like. Uh. So actually, <laughs> if you are somebody that weren't wasn't there and you w like watched it later, um, in the second between services, I I actually told John I was pretty sure I wanted to use second service because I added, I took out some things and I added some things, especially on the money section, um, in second service. That so I definitely, I think the thing that, that we've talked about this before. Um, I I know that there's a part of me, especially on a message like this, that I almost wish I had a practice run. Um, and I know that you do that. Like you almost practice running yourself. I think, and sometimes I've done that. The hard thing was like, I was literally like rewriting. Even Sunday morning I got in here and I went in, I went and sat in, in the living room and was just like, no, change the sentence. So I, even by the time I got up on stage, I hadn't really run through it well. So when I finished preaching on the 9am service, 
I went back and had a pen and just made a bunch of notes, mainly like, especially about giving and money. Um, I didn't like how, when I finished talking about that part of it, I didn't do enough to say, which I did in the second service, like rise is going to be unapologetic about asking you for money. Um, because we believe firmly in, in being generous in what we're doing with it, you know, building houses, these kind of things. And, um, so I, I spent more time in the second service kind of massaging, like I'm not talking about it's bad to talk about money. I'm saying if individuals are driven by greed, that's a problem. Hmm. Um, and I just, so I really, and I immediately after the second service, like definitely John, you second service, post that one. I don't like first service, um, which is the one you sat in. So that was, <laughs> I wish I'd done that better. Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't, I'll have to listen. I, it wasn't, I didn't think that anything you said in regards to any of the, the kind of the three motives were off. I, I felt like it's always, it's interesting when it's different when you're preaching versus also when you're sitting and listening. Cause then you start thinking about all the other people around you. Mm. And, and there's one of those, there's some of those things like, I think it is so important for us to like be transparent as you were of saying these things are issues that all of us can deal with, whether they be money, fame or uh, power. And, and we're not beyond that. And there's times we probably people could look at it and say, hey, you're you've been you've succumbed to that or been seduced by that. But there's also a part like when you're there, we are like, if someone's new, like, yeah, how do they how do they interpret that? Did, did that plant more seeds at times in them to have skepticism and suspicion versus trust and like, OK, you know, like, let, let's move forward. And and I didn't have an answer for that, but I just found I, I found and it's probably just my position as just pastor, like, just like, hmm, I wonder what, what that did. Um, but I know the second service, you kind of reiterate, like, in terms of money, like, oh, yeah, hey, this, we at least recognize this. And here's one of the things that we try to do in terms of helping move past some of these, yeah, these potential vices. So I think it's hard because, um, yeah, I don't know, like, the reason why, even just, I spent so much time rewriting and changing and trying to say it better. Like, I felt like I was in a subject or a topic that needed two or three or four weeks to like, even, you know, I even, I quoted a passage by Paul, where Paul says in Corinthians, essentially, those who preach the gospel should make a living preaching the yeah. gospel. As like, look, even Paul is saying there's, but Paul then goes on to say, but I didn't take any money from you. <laughs> yeah. And, but in the context of that whole letter, Paul is saying, I'm going to come to you and take an offering to raise money to give to other people. So like, like this idea of like where the church is raising money, where the church is paying its workers, where the church is giving money, to the community, all of that stuff is meeting the potential for greed to get in the way of it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I'm, I don't know. It's like, there's a part of me that felt like, I don't want to touch this. I don't want to bring this. I don't even, I don't want to just skip this chapter, this, these 12 verses. Um, but at the same time, skipping those 12 verses is what gets a lot of churches in trouble. And I, I don't know. Like I, that, I think, that's a I think hard you, thing. I think I you know. honored the text because everything I've even read commentary wise is like, there's a part of Paul who was trying to defend his own ministry because people may have been undermining it saying, Paul was only in this for these reasons. And, and so his motives are getting questioned. And so he's kind of given a defense because it's, these are real things that every person, church leadership, you mentioned this yesterday, church leadership, regular leadership, everyday life. Like these are like sneaky vices that can really, you know, make our motives not pure. And so I, I, I think it was, I appreciate how you went about it. It was just a weird thing. And you, you kept owning it. Like I'm the pastor talking about this right now. And, and so I was like, man, this would, I'm glad I gave this to Pete because I didn't have to preach this. But I did not think about it ahead of time when I signed, like, there is a lot underneath this. I think that might have been the hardest part about the whole message. I, and you and I haven't talked about this, but once I really got into it, there was a part of me that uh, similarly, just so people know, a couple weeks ago when we did the interview with Christopher, um, like Christopher is like my friend, like he was at my wedding, we're really close, but I was very much like, you need to do this interview because I think this is a topic that needs the lead pastor. There was a part of me that when I was on stage was like, I kind of wish Brandon was doing this message right now because it does feel like the potential for, and, and I am your employee in a sense, and not in a sense, literally, <laughs> like I work for you. So it's almost like, 
I was so worried that people were going to be like, is Pete like blasting his boss right now? <laughs> and I kept trying to think like, how do I work through this in a way that I'm trying to own this? I'm trying to present this from the perspective of our entire team, our entire staff. And, but I really think like, if I could just rewind the clock, there's a part of me that just wished you had had chapter two. Cause if, if, if someone was going to really dive into that topic, it almost felt like it needed to be more the person at the top, but I did what I could. I mean, and, and I, you know, part I of it was your traveling than, schedule. I actually think it comes off better with more transparency and honesty that it's not me. Oh, okay. And so I, I was, that's why I was thinking, I was like, it was just an interesting per, I expect here's a bad word, but like to be just sitting there kind of listening be like, I know these things are real. I know these things are vices and motive skewers, so to speak, for all of us. But it's also like it helps you take inventory. And like from Jamie and I, we just kept like looking at our own selves and saying like, okay, where, where are these perhaps in Rise City? Where are these inside of our own hearts? Where are these in our own personal life? And so um, I think if I would have been the one giving that message, it would have been like, well, of course, Lee Pastor is going to say you should trust Rise City and these things mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So I actually enjoyed it but i also could see the uncomfortability of it and so i but i had not considered any of that until i was sitting there like oh interesting like this is a i would say one thing just responding to something else you said because it's you know digging deeper is a place for it you made the comment about like didn't really do a lot of time defending rise i actually cut about four paragraphs <laughs> Because when I was reading it, because I actually, I've said this before, I, I write my messages kind of word for word and my way of practicing them is reading them. When I was reading it, like all of those paragraphs just felt so hmm. self-serving and almost yeah. like, it, it felt to me like when I got done, like I needed to just, here's here's the harsh reality. Let, let the fact that I'm giving you the harsh reality be what causes you to trust Rise City more than, but actually we're okay. You know? Yeah. The truth is yeah. blatantly telling what I honestly believe. I do think we're okay. I don't think I would have gotten on the stage and said any of that if I felt like they were problems for our church. Like, and I, I, I can say that on a podcast much easier than I can probably, I mean, maybe I should have said that on the stage. I don't know. But like, if I actually felt like we had a problem in those areas, there's not a chance I would get up and talk like that because in that case, I'm then actually <laughs> blasting yeah. people. Like I actually got on stage feeling like we, like I do feel like we're coming from a place of, we spent a lot of time, you know, I'm, um, I would just even say like, I, I listened to this whole thing about narcissism in the church. And it was like, you know, I listened to these kind of things and I, and I read a book, I mentioned Slubs for Jesus. And as I'm reading and listening, I'm this last week, I'm asking questions. Do I see this? Do I, do I see these things in, in my community and in, in us, in myself? And I, I think like, I was kind of like, you know, I'm trying to be completely open and objective. And I think that I am. And it's like, no, I don't really, like, I don't see this stuff. Um, I'm not, we're not perfect. No one's sure. perfect, yeah. but like, I don't, have I've never in 10 years had a single moment where I questioned how we're spending our money. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I know I'm part of that, but it's one of the reasons why it's easy for me with all of my church wound and hurts to work with you is because I trust you with money. Um, I don't feel like rise is trying to be some famous glitzy mega church. I've never felt that. I mean, I, and you know, I, <laughs> To be in this, if I was going to get really specific, working for you is is sometimes the opposite of power and control. <laughs> you know, we've talked about that. There's yeah. almost sometimes I'm like, come on, Brandon, be be be, be firmer. <laughs> You're so like team leadership, everybody. So I didn't feel like I need to talk about these things because Rise is wrestling with them. I more felt like I don't want Rise to ever wrestle with them. So let's talk about them now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I cut, mm. I cut quite a bit out just cause like, this feels a little too fake to me or that. too forced. So, but I put some of it back in second service. Well, I, I, I really, I thought it was a really good move preaching wise at the very end, how you, you brought everybody into it. Cause it could have been a way for everybody to been like, Oh, okay, this is a church thing. And then you kind of said, no, we're all ambassadors and this, we are the church. And where are these motives in our own lives sometimes lurking? Um, and in terms of like where fame or power or money can get the best of us. Motives are like, right, these subterranean under the surface things that are like, can be really sneaky. Mm. Like, what would you say, like how can someone assess their motives to like know whether or not what they're doing and why they're doing it is moving in the right direction of what Jesus wants? Like, 
Like, how do you go about checking motives? Because it's easy, like, even sometimes point it, I think that person has, like, bad motives. But, like, right. when you do honest personal assessment, how, how, how can you do that? Or what would you encourage people to do to take inventory? Um, my, uh, my daughter, Kira, made a comment. I think I might have mentioned this on the podcast. She said something to me a few months ago. She's been starting to learn guitar and do music. She plays with now the... The worship youth band, worship yeah. band in middle school. And a, a few months ago, I don't remember the exact wording, but she said to me something to the effect of, I don't think I should do this. And I was like, what? what why? You know, I, I was like, I thought it was more of the, uh, I'm getting bored. I don't want to practice kind of thing. I'm like, no, no, you need to keep practicing. Going. And she goes, I just, I feel like the only reason I'm up there sometimes is because I want to be up there, not because I want to worship Jesus. And I was like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> uh, if only everyone thought like a 13 year old, um, I just in that category, in that category, in that category. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, and what I had to tell her, we were driving the car. I said, Kira, listen, it is so good and right for you to be aware of that, but you need to know that if that kept you from doing what God wants you to do, no one would ever do anything for God because every human being feels that and senses that. And we live, we don't give up or quit or not do it because of the tension. We learn to navigate the tension. We learn to control the tension. Mm -hmm. We learn to not let it get out of hand. Um, one of my favorite arguments I have with Robert is <laughs> when we talk about whether or not you can do anything without self-interest. And the answer is no, you can't. But Robert is such this like pie in the sky optimist. He's like, no, you can, you can do things just for Jesus. And I'll be like, oh yeah. And why are you doing it for Jesus? Like, well, because, you know, because he wants you to, because you want, you know, eventually to hear him say, well done. And you want to get to have what everything at the end of the day has some kind of self-interest involved. And yeah. like, when you look at the scriptures, it's like when Jesus, and I, I, I referenced this verse in both services. He said, you know, you know how the Gentiles lord it over them, not so with you. He says, if you want to be great, become a servant. And I think that's the part of that passage that so often gets ignored, is that Jesus is actually speaking into my motives, knowing that I want to be great. <laughs> he mm -hmm. knew that all those disciples wanted something better than the life they currently had. And so when he calls them to be servants and self-sacrificial and to do things out of love, it's not like he's telling them somehow obliterate personal motives and make them all disappear. He's saying, no, no, let me, let me actually give you the thing that will bring about what your motive, you're motivating for something you want something, you want something better in your life. This is actually better. And I think where I was trying to go a little bit yesterday and using like kind of the harsh reference of almost like a drug. A drug gives us something that we want, a feeling, but it does it in an unhealthy, ultimately unproductive way. And I think the thing about even generosity is like, someone says, well, can you give from a non-motivated point? I don't think so. I think everybody has some motivation, but God is almost saying, listen, I know that you, I created you to have this feeling of, I call it what you want. Like there's almost like a, a goodness, a, a euphoria, mm -hmm. a sense of, yeah, when you give and God's like, yeah, yeah, I want you to have that, you know? And it's like, I want your world to be better. And when you live this way, everything gets better. And I don't try to live from a sense of, let me make sure I have no ulterior motives. I, I just say like, well, let's not have ulterior motives. Let's just bring the motives to the surface. What am I actually wanting? And if that motive is ugly and bad, call it to the carpet. But a lot of times, like, do I want a good life? Do I want a better life? Do I want good lives for my children? Do I want good things for me and my wife and my, my community? Yeah, I do. So, so what are what would be what? How would you categorically say these are good motives and these are bad motives? What, which is which? Because I think that's also is that subjective? Is that prescribed by Jesus? Like, how how can someone like even if they're just trying to wrestle, maybe they're just. I'm trying to do this whole Christian thing and I want to know, is my heart in the right place? Like what are good motives and what are bad motives? Man, I mean, I'm not an expert on it. Yeah. I think what I tried to do yesterday was I intentionally used the word overemphasis in three areas, mm -hmm. an overemphasis of getting more stuff for myself. Um, the thing about greed is, you know, I, and it's, it's a poison and it's like, 
I'm, I'm just driven this way. I'm wired this way. I, I talk this way. I'm not somebody that talks about things that we call sin in the, that's against the rules. You know, it is against the rules, but it's against the rules for a reason. Like greed is unhealthy. Like greed wrecks you. Like greed, like this constant desire to have more and to hold, like I, like it's, it's a vice of mine. Um, I don't have the, uh, I want to get rich thing. I have the, I don't want to be poor thing. Um, so greed for me looks like I need to like kind of be miserly, but it's, it's not healthy. It's not good. It doesn't bring goodness to my life. So when I'm doing things or making decisions that are feeding greed, there's a problem. Mm. So if I just say, Oh, bad motive, like bad, naughty, you know, Mm. it's like, well, it's not helpful for me personally. Maybe it is for other people. I say like, wait, what is, what is driving me right now? Healthy. Is it good for me? Like, cause if I'm trying to get famous because why am I trying to get famous? Because I think I'll be happier for some reason. Like I, I think the, 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 you know, the eight year old fat kid who had any friends still thinks in the back of his head, if a lot of people know who Pete Goodman is, I'll feel better about myself. You know, <laughs> like I won't be that nerdy, unpopular kid. Um, but I'm like, Pete, you, you tried that in high school <laughs> and mm. you, you kind of got it. You were popular in high school and you were miserable. Why are you still thinking that celebrity will make you somehow happier? It, you know that it's unhealthy. So if I just label it as like sinful or bad or don't, you know, naughty, whatever, it's like, I try to step back and say like, is what's driving me re- right now going to bring about health and goodness in my life? Or is it actually another lie, another drug saying you'll get a temporary high, but ultimately it's going to leave you flat. And I think greed and celebrity and the th- sense of power are ultimately things that leave us flat and leave other people around us wounded. So they're unhealthy. And mm-hmm. and so I think that's the question mark. And so, sorry, I know I'm familiar, but like in talking to my daughter, I'm like, listen, it's good for you to be aware that there's a part of you that kind of likes to be seen. There's a, almost like a dopamine rush of being a part of something big and know that never, never forget it, never lose sight of it, but it's okay to, and I, I think of the the movie chariots of fire where the guy's running. He's like, when I run, I feel the Lord's pleasure. It's like, sometimes it's okay to just enjoy something God created you to do and that you're bringing glory to God at the same time. And so you can, you can feel this tension in your heart that like, you know, there's a part of me that really likes this, but I'm trying to do it for the Lord. Living with that tension, it, you know, there's a way forward that's healthy and, and not leading you to unhealthy, but not being aware of it, <laughs> ignoring it is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Um, and that's what I told my daughter. I said, just, just keep, stay aware of it. Always yeah. be aware of it and don't let it run you or, or own you. Um, and so that's what I was trying to do yesterday. I was like, let's just be aware of it. Uh, mm. things that might lead us to things that aren't healthy. Yeah. So one of the things I, I was thinking about yesterday and kind of maybe close on this question, but like, um, you know, this is another example. And just when you look at the life of Christ, where it's like, this is something that was what he experienced as well. Like that, mm-hmm. that these exact same kind of, uh, skewed motives uh, were, were put in front of him in his life and his ministry. And so just kind of made off the top of your head, when you think of this, the life of Christ, and you think of perhaps him being persuaded or seduced by having bad, impure, bad, wrong, unhealthy motives in terms of money, uh, fame, and power, what are some ways that Jesus moved away from those uh, temptations or motives in the wrong direction and actually did it in the right way? I considered going in that direction and then realized there's no way I would get to it. So even just looking at Jesus's three temptations in the wilderness um, of, you know, being provided for, having your needs met, uh, fame, get up on this tower, let everybody see you. I, I think the real one that I definitely, it's, I had it in my notes and ended up deleting it. The temptation where Satan says, I'll give you all of this if you'll bow and worship me. Um, which, you know, there's different ways you can look at that. The way that I've personally always looked at it is Satan is offering Jesus something that Jesus was already going to (laughs) get. God was already going to give him the whole world. But the pathway that God had laid out was through a cross. And Satan was saying, I can give you all of the goodness, all the things you want without any of the pain, without any of the difficulty, without any of that suffering. Mm -hmm. And I I cut all of that on my message, but it was still there in the talk about celebrity briefly. When I said the thing about celebrity, the thing about seeking that is you're trying to get the kingdom without the cross, you know, and you can, 
And I think Jesus shows us that even today, and more, even maybe more now than ever, because of the ease of building a platform and growing an audience and getting attention just through talent or digital media, you can have the kingdom without the cross. And we see so many people, so many pastors, I think, who made the opposite decision. And just to be clear, I, I, I want to just make sure I don't, I don't think that, you know, I don't want to name names, but most of them are on TV anyway. These guys who basically shot to fame and then you realize they had no character behind it. I don't think they sat in a room with the devil and like, okay, Satan, I'll worship you. It's <laughs> yeah. not what we're talking about here. They're, they're all men and women who started off with good intentions and probably from the beginning wanted to glorify God and things. It's not Satan sitting in a room talking to your face. It's this idea put in front of you that, you know, if I, if I just push these buttons and I just act this way or I just do this thing, I can actually skip all the hard work of <laughs> actually, you know, becoming the kind of person God wants me to be. And, and I can just jump straight to the top and be famous. It's the same temptation. And for Jesus to just say like, get away from me. No, yeah. like the way that, the way that Jesus became famous was through being lifted up on a cross and everything good that came out of his life and ministry came ultimately through suffering and hardship and pain and enduring and it didn't come just through instant fame. And when they came to him and said, let's make you king right now, you know, he's like, nope. And he left, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got in a boat and ran away. He's like, no, that's not the way that God called me to become king. And I think what's for me, I guess, and in, in where, where I'm at in my own life is just like, you know, I'm, I'm almost 45 and um, so old. It's, so it's getting old. old. Oh man, I'm falling apart. <laughs> There's a part of me that says like, God, even whether it's 45 or 70, don't bring me anything in my life that would go beyond the character that I have in my, in my heart and who I am as a person. I don't want it. If you, you know, I don't, would it be nice to be world renowned or something? Sure. Would it be great to be handed a billion dollars? Sure. Whatever. But I just think like, I just said, God, I don't, if my character's not ready for these things, don't give them to me. Cause mm -hmm. I don't, and that's the thing is like, I, I feel like it's, I don't want the kingdom without the cross. And um, hmm. I, I don't know. I, I see it in Jesus and I'm trying to balance it in my life. Yeah. Not that anyone is offering me a billion dollars, but if you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a very nice first book signing for a billion, do do that'd billion be, dollars. That'd be amazing. I, uh, Jamie and I were watching last night and I'll, I think this kind of it comes to mind and maybe finish with this, but I, uh, have you seen the documentary called Stutz? No, that's out there. Um, Stutz. Stutz. So there's a psychiatrist by the name of Phil Stutz that um, has Parkinson's, and the actor Jonah Hill, mm -hmm. I think he was in Moneyball or whatever, but um, he, it's his personal psychiatrist, and so they film this documentary as far as the the way in which Stutz goes about um, doing therapy, and it's countercultural, he would say, to the therapeutic world because he's not just sitting there listening. Um, but he's like, no, in each session, like we're going to make something happen. Like this is, it's crazy just for me to sit here and be neutral. Um, and so they film for an hour and a half, essentially like, oh, and you find out later, it's like over the course of like three or four years, they film this, but some of their sessions and how he goes about it and these different tools and constructs. And Jonah Hill's actually sitting in the room? Oh yeah. Oh, interesting. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but, uh, it's got, it's got some choice language. So, you know, if you're <laughs> just be aware of that, um, but one of the things that he talks about, what, as Jamie and I are watching it, we're, we're watching this and so much of what Phil Stutz describes were these constructs that really are, they, they, were, they were scripture just in psychiatric terms. Because hmm. he, he talked about like, um, he talked about this like, uh, just this notion of how in life, one of the things that you have to, you have to embrace and know that there will never be, an, uh, everyone has to and will always perpetually go through pain There'll always be continual work and they'll always have uncertainty. And until you embrace those three realities, like you're going to continue to try to chase things and avoid those things. But when you realize pain is just inevitable, continual work is inevitable and uncertainty is inevitable, then you're going to move forward almost like the idea of the cross, like, and, and you're going to, those things are going to shape your character. And he talks about this other thing, like a project X, like this, this invisible entity that will continue to try to like, cause you to doubt or to to look less at yourself and try to project yourself more 
And, um, and, and Jonah Hill the whole time is talking about how he had this whole, like, I guess he was severely overweight when he was younger and all these things. He struggled to try to, to try to up, obtain these things. And he used fame for himself. Like that was his avenue in order to try to like really overcome. But when there was still pain there and there was still like, he had to work to somehow stay famous and he had uncertainty about who he was, like these things crushed him. And then, but Stutz's thing was like, you got to get past that. Like, this is never going to end. Right. And there's essentially saying like, there's, there's always going to be a cross in your way to the kingdom. And, and, and a, that's just a part of life. And so like, sometimes with the motives that we have in terms of money, greed, and power, we think that those are avenues to overcome those obstacles rather than like, no, 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 those are still going to be obstacles. So your motives, if they try to cause you to side circumvent some of those things, on the back side of it, you're going to find yourself very disappointed and less of the person who you're supposed to be because those are formative aspects of mm. your character. So, I think that's good. I, if there was one thing yesterday that, I don't know, made me, the, and I don't want to, I feel like, I don't know how to say this the right way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember one time you were preaching and somebody kind of maybe did something that felt a bit distracting or off to you and you sort of responded to it and um which is always like a tension in my head like don't <laughs> don't don't respond i when i briefly was like sharing some of the bad experiences that i'd had in my life there were people like like were laughing and i was like i'm not really trying to be funny right now <laughs> um but i also was thinking i almost wanted to stop and pause and just say, can I just say for the record that I'm pretty sure the guy that stole the church's money and ran off with his wife has a long history of pain in his life that he doesn't want to deal with. Mm. And I know for a fact that the pastor that I worked under who ended up and coming out as gay yeah. was abused as a child. And I like so many of these people that we see falling and like, oh, you sinner. A lot of what they're doing is they're trying to overcome pain or yeah. things in their heart and their past and like whether it's fame or money or power are their way of trying to deal with it and i think what at, at this point in my life i'm i'm there was this part that was so uncomfortable that people were laughing but i didn't want to like completely veer off and change everything i was trying to do but it was like even the people that do the worst things we have to remember are often just responding to pain and like mm. it's like you're seeing this as a way of coping oftentimes. And, uh, and that goes back to the whole thing about right and wrong motives. What's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Is this motive actually trying to get you to cope with something inside of you the wrong way or an unhealthy way? Yeah. Um, and I think like, even you know, we've talked about before, like the thing about psychology is it can be twisted and abused, but all truth is God's truth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> like, if it's if it's wise, it's wise because God made it wise, and yeah. uh, I think there are non Christians who are, have tapped into God's wisdom. Well, it's it's fascinating because he he came around and talked like he wouldn't label himself as a specific, you know, religion, but he definitely spoke to this notion of like higher forces now, and like I mean, it's just interesting, hmm. and like I, I just I think that like um, especially when you see what I would say are like echoes of like what the scriptures have already proclaimed, and others are picking up on it and maybe giving different language to it but then also seeing like for jonah hill the way in which as he as you get to the end of it like it's changed his life and he's reproved his motives and and these things he pursues are differently now and it's like if all you know, as god if all god's truth is god all truth is god's truth like essentially he's moving in alignment with the way god wired and created him to live and it's resulted in his betterment hmm. and a part of that was him assessing deep down why he does what he does what things have brought pain what things he's thought and in and so I just was I was just really intrigued by the by the the documentary because I was like wow there is so much scripture in here but just not even being recognized but it shows that like as we walk in the way God wants us to walk and have the motives in the right direction it actually does result in our best so I would imagine good. I I don't know this but it's probably not unusual the I'll say this politely um Oftentimes, like heavy set kids develop a sense of humor and become the clown because it's the only th like getting other people to laugh with you is the only thing that's better than getting them laugh at you. Yeah. yeah. And you, you, you come to this place of like, if I can, I'll just lean into it and I'll be the silly fat kid who everyone laughs with and at. 
but it'll bring about fame and money, which will cover up the pain of actually feeling this yeah. deep sense of I've been rejected my whole life. Or, and uh, I, I know, like, I'm not, I'm not in the same boat, but I, there's a part of me that's always felt that. Like, I, up until high school, I was, I was that like really chubby, shy kid that developed a sense of humor because if I can get you to laugh, then it's like. I've now created this like thing of like, okay, now everything, no one's looking at me. We're all just joking about this thing over here. And um, yeah. And I, mm. I, I could see how someone like, like that. Cause he, I, if I remember right, he was kind of the goofy yeah, chubby kid. Yeah. All he talks about all of it. Yeah. They bring his mom in and do the counseling mm. session with his mom. It, it's just, like I said, I don't know if I'm endorsing it. I think the concept is interesting. Definitely got some four letter words. <laughs> like, um, but, but it was, it was interesting. And, and maybe, and maybe the thing that would just kind of lay in the plane is you know, talking about motives and all these different things, like, and people sometimes want to, where's a safe space to share? Like, I hope that the church can become, and pastors can become that place. But the place to start in terms of just motive evaluation is like, begin by just laying it before the Lord. That's a part of like what prayer is versus asking, like, like here, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's how my motives are, God. Like, this this doesn't seem right. And just beginning even in that way is is a good step and a path in the direction that God would say, yeah, like, let's, I'm not afraid of those motives. I recognize them and let's, let me help reprove them. Um, but don't deny that, that there are motives to everything <laughs> and, and to take evaluation and give them to the Lord and help and lead you. So completely affirm that. Yeah. I, I would say if you, no one ever will, <laughs> but if anyone read my journals, they would see a lot of bad motives written out. Uh, because that's my way. God, I'm feeling this right now. Yeah, <laughs> I want this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lord, whatever you want. You know, and I I use my journal as a way of just I want this. I know I which, shouldn't, but I do. Which <laughs> Stutt said, if you this is how you find your true self, is you have to just write it out. Yeah, it's it was a, journaling. I, I was like, oh my gosh, man, this guy yeah. should become a Christian and a preacher. So <laughs> just change your language. <laughs> like my Elise was watching this. Is like, oh goodness. It's like, yeah, we don't we don't talk. So about she this. was watching with you if, if, initially. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, maybe we'll. Room, room. we could come back to this later so all right i think we're good so uh yeah first thessalonians you didn't go all the way through chapter two so now i got some more verses i gotta cover but i'll do the end of chapter two and chapter three this week and we'll talk about it next week on digging deeper so sounds good Thanks, man. all right see everybody